Hello, I'm Kamla. My guest today is Megan Smith. She was the CTO of the United States under President Obama. Prior to that, she worked in Silicon Valley in various companies, including Google, Planet Out, and General Magic. Welcome. Thank you. So did you work at Apple too? Uh, I worked at Apple in Tokyo. Uh, ah, right out of yes. school in Apple, Japan. Yes, yes, that was your first job, I forgot. So you yes. worked at the iconic Apple, too. Yes. Okay, so uh, you're part of this new documentary mm -hmm. on General Magic, which was supposed to be the most iconic company and was going to create this pocket crystal, mm -hmm. this personal communicator, mm -hmm. but it didn't take off. We didn't make it. It was too early. You know, it was big and no one knew what you're talking about with email and, you know, so it, it took longer. We were trying to do so many different parts and it just took longer, but directionally, we were correct. Yes, you uh, were. Uh, why did you join General Magic? You know, I was a young engineer. I had just finished school. I had gone to Tokyo, worked for Apple, and I met Did Billy. you speak Japanese? I, I, you know, I spoke Spanish, basic <laughs> Spanish, and I said, I want to go somewhere there. And so my Nicholas Neger Ponte ran the media lab. I was like, how about Tokyo? I'm like, uh. So I ended up in Japan. I learned so many things. And we worked on multimedia and what became really beginning of internet, and I met Bill Atkinson. Mm. And Bill, of course, is one of the founders of General Magic, and he um, had written HyperCard, was one of the Mac, original Mac team. And so he encouraged me to come. And so for me, as, as a young engineer, the opportunity to come to a new startup in Silicon Valley, Bill, I really wanted to learn how to build a product from start to finish. And the vision was incredible, because I love working on things that would help people in their daily lives, mm. you know, in their work and in their vision. What were you doing at Apple? I was, uh, I was called the multimediator. We worked a lot on HyperCard and multimedia. What became the internet, sort of multiple media, internet network technologies at the time, it was CD-ROMs, ah. you know, or LaserDiscs or HyperCard or MacPaint or really working with developers in Japan and the U.S. getting their software back and forth and working with the teams to bring the new functions of what was happening on computers at the time in addition to desktop publishing that sort of the next wave. When was the first time you got to use a computer? Hmm. In high school, middle school, I think. Uh, this was? The Apple II. So in the 80s. Okay. The, I'm sorry, in, sorry, in the 70s. When, when, in the 70s, we got some Apple II uh, computers. And it was so fun. You know, and it was so basic. Actually, even earlier in that, I just watched on uh, the, the TRS-80. We had a TRS-80 on a cart, and we'd wheel it around. And it was mostly in this one, like, um, you know, janitor's closet, and you know, a bunch <laughs> of us would go in there and use it. And you know, we had the the sort of crazy paper and things so early. It was so fun, though. How did you get interested in becoming an engineer? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm not a computer scientist. I'm a mechanical engineer, and I was very much interested. We were lucky in my high school. We had mandatory science fair. And so you had to do a project. So instead of just learning what others have done, you had to think about what, how could I advance the field. At the time, President Carter was putting solar panels on the White House, and we had a huge energy crisis. And so I started to think about green energy, wind, solar, those things, and I began to do projects in the area of uh, alternative energy at the time, and now I'm becoming mainstream renewable energies uh, these days, but at the time it was early. But were there engineers in your family? Yeah, lots of engineers. Really? Um, my grandfather worked a lot on highways and then at U.S. Steel. My dad uh, did a lot of housing, but also uh, he was an artist. So there was a lot of making of things in our family. My uncle worked in the energy field on kind of making cleaner uh, forms of coal production ah, okay. um, and industrial engineering. My other uncle was also working on industrial and, and supply chain. So, but all the guys. And so when I went to engineering school, I wanted to go. My grandpa was like, well, why would she want to do that? And my mom thought, because of you guys. And, uh, and so once I went, my grandfather came full circle. He's like, we're engineers, my granddaughter and my grand." You know, so. So there was no yeah. resistance from your parents, just your no, grandfather no. asked that question. Yeah, and okay. he, he didn't see it until he saw it. And so change comes that way, right? You know, yeah. we have a lot, of, lot to overcome. Yeah. Uh, lots of women and men have done extraordinary things, people from everywhere in engineering for all of history, it's just sometimes we forget. Why mechanical engineering? Mechan I really, I, we, my mom started a bike club for Western New York. We had worked on bikes forever. You know, I know how to fix bikes from being young. I loved physical things and some of the energy area had pulled, pulled me into the windmills and others. So for General Magic, my job was, you know, touch screens and LCDs and product on the physical layout. Should we, how many buttons should we have? What kind of, uh, you know, Port. ports and, you know, what kind of power port and what other ports. We created something called Magic Bus um, with Tony and others, and it's, it's very much like Waltimate, like the way that USB works today, so it was very early. So we're up to all these things, 
made lots of devices in the team so that uh, my colleagues could be programming the computer, but they could use something, could pick up and touch. It was a little bigger than this, but prototypes like that, did tons of work with that. Yeah, so in the film we see you uh, with, with the general magic device and you say, okay, this doesn't work or it's not responding. Yeah, and there weren't any, there were touch screens, of course there were some for certain applications, not, not for a generalized application. We didn't, you know, what screen size should we use? How, what should this device be? How should it feel? What size? And so working with suppliers, all these incredible LCD manufacturers who are making television size, how do we get something small? like this. What about touch screens? There were different kinds of inventions. Some that were separated by dots, some that were using the electrical difference, some that were one idea that Wendell had for string gauges that would just feel you push different ways. So it was really the basic technology for all the things that were coming together for the physical device to work. And I was in the hardware team, which was also working on the boards. So what chips and designs there, how we're going to miniaturize this stuff. Because it was, you know, everything we worked on was typically shipping in a large computer, not in something you could carry around that you could put into your pocket. How does a mechanical engineer get involved in a software slash hardware company, you know? And how difficult was it yeah, for you? I, I think, you know, the devices have to manifest physically and mechanical engineers do a lot of this kind of design, the physical layout of the product itself as well as product design uh, with the sort of more artistic designers, almost like the architect. You know, how's the building gonna look and how's it gonna function? So you think within building, you have civil engineers and structural engineers and then artistic architectural engineers and plans and plumbing. So that's really what the mechanical engineer is for a device like this. Did you find it strange that you're a mechanical engineer and working for a startup like uh, General Magic? No, it's just that there's always mechanical engineers around. They might be working on the physical product design. They might be working on the manufacturing processes for making the devices. Uh, they may be working on particular components uh, or thermodynamics and those things. But there's uh, mechanical engineers all over the industry. There's mostly computer science coders, that world, test engineers in that, that group. And then there's the hardware engineers in the chip side and then the board layout, and then mechanical engineers kind of putting all those together. So they're really at the back, back, back. You know, they're they not at the forefront. It, yeah. but what I'm saying is, as, a, as an observer, mm -hmm. you don't think of a mechanical engineer right. in a... You think of them more in a car company or a bicycle company, other the, things. Yeah. Right? yeah Why? Mechanical engineers are all over almost all industries, you know, in some form, because the product has to man manifest in some physical way. Similar to chemical engineers. You know, there's chemistry and then the production of the chemistry. Hmm. You know, in a chemical plant or an oil plant, you know, petroleum, whatever that is, hmm. or uh, pharmaceuticals, etc. Those are chemical engineers. What did you learn from your uh, time at General Magic? I learned so much. We were so, you know, I had done one job since school where I had met Bill uh, Atkinson and um, at Apple in Tokyo, and then came over. So, uh, you know, I I think learning is apprentice journey mastery. Mm. And uh, the more you can be around, even if you have a more junior job, if you're around extraordinary people, you can learn really fast. Also, young people can bring a lot if the elders, those who've, who have much more experience, give them the space. And so we were in that kind of a situation. It was a beautiful team um, where we had extraordinary talent who had already shipped products at scale, understood what that looked like coming from different parts. And then some of us who are a little bit younger and newer at this were right in the mix and included very deeply as colleagues, but also we could be mentored at any moment by somebody who had a lot more experience or expertise for how to approach something quickly or how to solve a problem, how to approach uh, the challenges that we had in the various, as various pieces came together. But what did you take away from your experience that you were able to then use uh, with your time at Planet Out, Google, mm -hmm. and I as CTO? Yeah, many, I took, I took so many things. First off, I took how you can be in a team and treat each other well. You know, not only a lot of yelling and a lot of this, but a lot of really wonderful, collegial, but very high-paced, intense work. People worked all the time. Uh, and, and, but there was uh, our third grade teacher for my boys, she has on the board, in effort, there's joy. Mm. And General Magic was very much that, in effort, there's joy. And so can you have kind environments with extraordinary people and really include people and hear ideas and get the collective genius? You don't you hear that, but you don't hear that phrase you just used, kind environment. Yes, and I think Silicon Valley has strayed away from the kind of environment we were allowed to be in, uh, in General Magic, and become much more of this intellectual combat, very programmer, uh, you know, one group of people, one style, very fraternal. Uh, you know, I have two boys I love 
uh, I want men to come and do well, but I want women and men to be working together uh, and balance these cultures and, and really have the respect for those who are really extraordinary masters. Wend Wendell Sanders mm. uh, and Brian, his son, have had uh, a chip in almost every Apple product ever. Wendell's one of the coolest engineers you could ever work with. He worked at Fairchild when he was young. You know, the chip story there of the hardware side, what an honor to work with someone like Wendell, to work with Joanna Hoffman or Susan Kara, Bill Atkins and Andy Hertzfeld. So creating, they created an environment that I think Steve had created for them where it was really, really intense. We're moving as fast as we can, but we... But was he kind? But was he kind? Yeah, you know, they talk about Steve and he comes out differently in their stories than some of how he's been portrayed. I also think it's interesting that he had a gender balance team, you know, and that's not always seen in the stories when they're retold, but it's the truth of the people I worked with who worked for him. Hmm. A lot of women in those teams. Yeah, which is unusual. It wasn't unusual for Steve. That's how no, but, but in, but today it, it is, yeah. which is unfortunate. We've gone really far. We've strayed far from where we started. You know, why women why, why men, is that? Why is that? I don't know. We have to work on it. It's a real challenge uh, for the country, for the world, for the technology. As we go into artificial intelligence, it's so important that we get many more voices in the, kind of, the, the type of kind environment that we had at General Magic that let us uh, bring things forward in these ways. But also for my learning, um, I worked very closely with Mike Stern, who was our general counsel, uh, Marco Demaras, like people who were doing deal work. Um, and so I, I think I learned an extraordinary round, amount, um, my boss Don, uh, about deal work and partnerships too. So we worked with some of the greatest companies in the world, you know, Apple and Matsushita and uh, Philips and Sony and Motorola. Uh, you know, all these incredible device partners. So I worked very close with them because the physical device, we were making a reference design and they were making a final product, a little bit like Android is made um, today, which Andy Rubin was in the team at the time and I think learned some of those things. So it was a real great way to almost, I think you can be in a team and almost go to business school, right? Uh, and learn how to deals and partners and teamwork as well as engineering, you know, more engineering school of learning how to ship a product. So I got to have both of those learnings with this incredibly talented, kind uh, mentoring team. You come back to that word again and again, kind. Mm -hmm. uh, did you grow up in a kind environment? Yeah, I Okay, did. So, so it is uh, a value that was inculcated in you as a kid? Yes, it's a value and also um, I think it, it's where greatness thrives is where there's a uh, kind, encouraging, intense, you know, if, if you look at the U.S., uh, you know, this idea of the pursuit of happiness. It's not happiness as static, uh, but the pursuit of it, and the pursuit of it for everyone equally, not one person blasting another, but how do we get into that mode where we're together looking into the future and moving. What was it like to work with President Obama? Oh, he's incredible. Um, and the team, I mean, President Obama is a talent magnet. And so not only he himself, but the extraordinary colleagues that came to work together, and also the career uh, government, civil servants who have worked in our government forever. I mean, I met the most extraordinary people. Uh, and so what I liked about coming to government, having been in Silicon Valley, it hadn't occurred to me to go. But was when I got there, I didn't need to know about economics. I didn't need to know about law or comms. I needed to know what I knew about technology and innovation and new methods. And so we could work almost in a Navy SEALs team with incredible colleagues in government to work on some of the harder problems. Like? And, uh, so poverty and hunger. And as a CTO? Yes, as a CTO? Technology relates to everything. You know, uh -huh. So innovation relates to everything. President Lincoln got the Pony Express and he moved to the Telegraph. So in these days, we need to move forward, whether it's in the school lunch program and working with the USDA. On, that's a big data problem. You know, we can do self-driving cars, why don't we use some of the capabilities of natural language and machine learning on this challenge of getting the children, 22 million children in the winter eat free and reduced lunch and we only are organized enough to get six million in the summer. That's a big data problem. You know, how do we work on this complex system with different states and cities and teammates and what the rules are, make sure the children are eating and the siblings aren't taking it or it's not wasting and lots of complexity in problems that you don't think are tech problems, but they really are problems that technology can bring a lot of value to. What does the CTO of uh, US do? The focus is to help the president and their team harness the power of data, 
innovation and technology on behalf of the American people and the world. Is and this new? Harness the power of data? Is this a yeah, new? The, the job CTO, like the science advisor, reports to the president. They actually work together in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And President Obama created the CTO job. I was the third person to serve in that, and that will continue. Congress has put it into law. Anish was the first. Oh, yes, Anish and then Todd Park. Um, and they, the idea is just to have this sort of disruptive, techie advisor who's really looking at what are the most modern things we can do, and not only for policy itself, if we're in a conversation about net neutrality or encryption or, or how to use technology better in the Ebola response. And you're not running engineering, you're not running NASA, you're not running the Department of Energy, you're bringing that kind of almost a like corporate skill from uh, that advisor into the president's team, just like they would have a Surgeon General, they would have an economist or a lawyer or the you know, chief of staff leading uh, a co communicator, an operator. You want a techie, a science advisor. These two characters are very important uh, because tech and digital affect all of our world, the network technologies especially. Do you miss being a CTO? It was fun and uh, it was an honor. Uh, we were able to accomplish a lot of things, um, working with amazing people, just working on getting more Americans into better, higher paying jobs like tech hire. You know, nine out of 10 parents want computer science taught at school. We were able to do computer science for all. And we see that all over the country. Still so emerging Wyoming just voted in the CS for all that all children in Wyoming will be learning coding. Oh, from really? Kindergarten from 2023, that's the fifth state. You Which was the first state? Uh, let's see, it was uh, Rhode Island, Arkansas, Virginia, and I'm forgetting one. And then, and then and, and, uh, Wyoming. And also Chicago. You, this is the third largest school district. You can't graduate from high school in Chicago now without learning some coding and computer science. So they've scaled themselves in training the teachers. So one of the things we would always do is, okay, if Chicago's there, can Chicago help get the word out and help others who are trying to do the same? So we often built community practice, like the data science cabinet, which is community practice. So bringing these tech ways um, from our Silicon Valley world over here and learning the other ways that we could, I call it play the whole orchestra <laughs> on the hardest problems and field the whole American team. Do you have a gentle magic device? Uh, I guess I do. <laughs> the <Because>, iPhone. <laughs> yeah, this actually, this is an Android, but uh, it's... Oh, uh, it's an Android. Yeah, Pardon I, me. <laughs> I love both of them and uh, I love all of them. These devices are incredible. We also have great challenges with them. They can be weaponized as we saw the network can be weaponized. So we have to be mindful for what our vision is and inclusive and really bring people in. And as we hit these policy questions, you know, just like those, you know, with nuclear or other things, the, these, uh, we have to have these conversations. And, uh, and evolve well to the values that we hope for. You know, the values that, that the teams originally thought in the idea of pocket crystal, something that would be beloved and help you not steal your attention and your children's attention all day. So you raise a very interesting question. It's an age old uh, dilemma. Mm -hmm. Technology is Janus faced. Mm -hmm. You know, it depends on who is using it. Yeah, right? who's designing it. Who is designing it. And a lot of them, there's no malintent when. Sometimes there's malintent. There is, but yeah. by and large. The Russian bots had some pretty malintent. Okay, <laughs> we are going off yeah. at, at a global uh, level, yeah. but I'm only confining myself to the sure, U.S. Sure. So usually there is no malintent. You Often know? there isn't. There are certainly people who are trying to, to do some, some bad things sometimes, and you have to have security technologies, and it's a bit of an arms race. Uh, it's a huge arms race to stay ahead. But really people tend... Often they meant well. And mm. so you, as you hit the problems, you need to move quickly to resolve them. Um, these challenges you have, you know, what does it mean to have full privacy? What, it, what, is, what do we want that to be? How do we want that uh, to work in our society as we find these things, as Just, we leave our data trails all around? And we leave lots of data trails. Mm -hmm. You know, you could be the most careful person, but then we do leave. My final question is, um, how do we deal with this notion of information that is verified mm -hmm. and fact-checked? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Because um, that is as a CTO, uh, you important. probably would have, it would have been on the top of your sure. agenda. And this is not a new challenge. Um, you know, if, if you go back to Cold War times, yes, yeah. there was disinformation, misinformation. Sure. Martin but Luther the, King, the KGB often trying to... No, but, but, we, but we weren't connected. We didn't have these devices. You know, mm. you depended on the newspaper or you right. depended on the channel and you could tell that this channel was so and so... On a spectrum, you could Mostly place this. Mostly we could tell, although yeah. I, I would note, uh, interestingly, Benjamin Franklin really deployed a team out to the colonies to make sure that the press was stronger in those days because of challenges like this. So it's vigilance. If you walk by the U.S. archives, 
the National Archives that says, you know, for democracy, it's vigilance at all times. And so we have to have that. And in our time, it's, you know, people trying to trick each other uh, with, with false news um, or, or phishing or other things. And we have to continue to become good at that. Um, do you ever think about it? Sure. Do you, do yeah, you think about solutions? Yeah, I think about solutions. Mostly, again, uh, I try to find people who have extraordinary ideas and help them do better scout and scale for the solution makers and help them. There are people, over, there's 7 billion people on the planet, so there's pretty good ideas out there that are already in the works uh, for all kinds of challenges. Um, so not only uh, the security type challenges and, and those around information, but also solving for more people to have a job they would love. Uh, more people to have entrepreneurial opportunity, more people to have less, let's have less hunger, let's have more gender equality. And there's ways to use technology for all of these positive things, as well as notice its negative impact and try to sort of be in the arms race faster on the good side. I'm going to be a contrarian and mm -hmm. suggest that maybe everybody can get food, but getting all of us getting a job is probably not going to be there in the next 10, 15 years because I think we're going through a tectonic shift just like the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. came. And the change came slow uh, when the Industrial Revolution, but today the change is coming very fast. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us are not going to have the skills to have a job. Right. Does There's, that plague you? Um, I don't necessarily agree with that thesis. I think that it's, uh, there are different options and depends on how focused we are on the solutions. If we want to have more and more conversations and discuss it, then it's going to be too slow. If we want to more quickly look at where in our country people are solving this problem, because you know, I've been to Idaho, I've been to the Delta region, I've been um, to the, you know, out to the Pacific, I've been across um, you know, our Great Lakes, Rust Belt areas and others. Americans are getting it done and nobody knows. So flipping our conversation from talking about what could be to what people are starting to do that could fix it would help a lot. Because if we lifted those solution makers who already have extraordinary solutions for Americans to, you know, coding boot camp in three months, 23,000 Americans would come into coding through a three month program when that didn't exist a couple years ago. So that's a pretty great solution. Could we scale that? Um, but would I mean, they be good programmers? Sure, they'd be good. It's apprentice journey mastery. People are smart. Right, so you have to start somewhere. It's just a faster track than the longer degree. They will also do degrees. So every path, Melinda Gates was just at Grace Hopper talking about every path in, let's open them up. Right, so I believe that the fast track is to go look more quickly at who's already got something promising or working and help them scale, move faster on what's working, share it faster, use our amazing networks to do that. Uh, and then we can have the kind of world we want use those networks to have the conversations about surveillance world or an abundant world. Like, what do we want? And then let's look for who's got, we call them sometimes the positive deviants. Leave we've on got to hustle. That's who <laughs> yeah. we are. Yes, so that's We're your message. <laughs> that's your message. You've got to hustle. can do, people. And <laughs> yes. so let's go, you know, bring it. Yeah. And, uh, and let's bring our entrepreneurs and our engineer, engineers, people. Let's make high school so much less boring. Mm. Half of our students walk out in some of these high schools, it's too boring. And those teachers are fabulous and they're being forced to teach in a particular way. And so again, let's go find the extraordinary teachers who are already crushing it. And they've been doing that for a while. I got to go be taught by many of them in my lifetime. So flip the classroom. Have, flip it into a way where the teachers are more empowered, those master teachers, and they can help others to come in their direction. Active learning. One of my favorite things is in uh, Los Angeles, the teams there have taken the data the data of the city hmm. from running the city, whether it's garbage or the zoos or schools, and they've brought it into the community colleges and into the colleges. So that's the homework. How much more fun is that? That's the kind of data science I want to work on, solve stuff in my community. Many more people will become technical and interested in creative jobs in that way. So you have to give uh, kudos to the teacher who's doing that, or set you of find, teachers. Again, it's the same thing as finding the Bezos. Find those great teachers who are already here, they've been here for decades, and help them have more of a voice and position to coach, just like we got coached by our general magic mentors, coached by those folks, and bring that kind of learning into more and more classrooms. So you're always looking? Yeah, for the solution makers. Uh, they're magical. There's magic in everyone, and if you can not only find those who've already found it and doing the things and help them spread on the topic of interest to them, but also have everybody else find that creative confidence that they have, we can solve most of the challenges that humanity faces. How did you develop this can-do attitude? 
I think you do it from the beginning, you know, from, from when childhood, you're younger. from younger. And if we missed it, bring it later. When did you get it? I think I got it very early. My parents were always out. My dad started the recycling center. They started, my mom started the bicycle club. They worked on civil rights. They worked in the community on challenges and they didn't give up. They worked with colleagues. They got in tough conversations, learned, evolved. That's what we have to do together. So it started at home for you? Sure. And then okay. we had great teachers. We had never had any money. The public school system, Buffalo, we always had extraordinary teachers. And so we could learn from them. They just do things and we could see how. And so we went with them. We learned that habit. Practice makes permanent. Oh, not perfect, but permanent. Yes. So what you do is what you do. So if you make it boring, it's boring. If you make it incredible and you really expect the talent that's there to show up, it does. Who inspires you? So many people. If you, if you were to have a dinner party and you were told you could only get six people, who would you get? I don't know. I would, you could get some of the incredibly famous you know, colleagues. They, they, they don't have to be history, famous. They from, don't have to. from history, I would get people like George Washington Carver. Hmm. He's such a great American who saw the malnutrition, went into the lab. He's, we think he's the peanut guy. He's the rotate the crops guy. Uh, and then he went out and trained 2,000 farmers a month. I mean, amazing, heroic people. Um, who did that? And so I'm inspired by young people mm. now, and uh, and matching them with great mentors and moving faster on hard problems that matter, that they care about, that are in the Catherine Johnson uh, from uh, Hidden Figures, you know, who calculated the Apollo missions and and others, um, you know, John Glenn, others. Uh, she always says, share your passion, share your passion, and if adults would share their passion with young people, I think that that would help as mentorship bring them forward, whether they choose that topic or something of interest to them. So those are two people. Who, yeah. who would be the other four? I think a bunch of young people, different people, people, uh, you know, um, from history. Someone like Hypatia, you know, also always looking for the people who got disappeared from history. Ada Lovelace, you know, Ada wrote a 55-page paper um, around the time Darwin wrote Origin of the Species about the beginning of computer science and artificial intelligence. She said, I wish to bequeath to the generations a calculus of the nervous system. So she's the founder of computer science and AI. And she, you know, was so famous at the time. Uh, Charles Dickens was at her deathbed. So, but she just disappeared. So to bring her back. The Computer History Museum has her. Yeah, she's great. Also, Ida B. Wells, who used data science and journalism to stop us from lynching people. The intersectionality of people. Jane Addams, who won the Nobel Peace Prize for inventing social work considered the most dangerous woman in America at one point. Like, how do we hear from them about these ingenious things that they were doing, that they would bring, and find those in our lives today who are like them, who we can help? We, well, you have a great list of guests there. And I think we would all love to be part of the uh, dinner to hear them all talk. Yeah. So you know, it'll be very interesting. Us. Yes. And also, what I love is, like, we got to see in General Magic how to make something. Yes. Right? How did they make these things? How was it very real? Not what we read now when it's all perfect and, and happened, but how, how, how was it on the path so that we can understand how to do it today? Megan, thank you so much yeah, for inspiring you. us and for making us uh, feel positive because I think a lot of the times we forget to be positive, I think. Yeah, and we can really do these things. We have huge challenges. And really it's in the collective genius of supporting each other that we can address it and, and make some progress together. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you missed any of our show, you can catch them on our website, kamlashow.com. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back again next week with another new conversation. Until then, goodbye.